So in 1336, uh, Ashikaga Takauji receives the title of shogun from Emperor Komyo. And so this begins the second shogunate in Japanese history, the Ashikaga shogunate, which is ruled by the Ashikaga family. So unlike the Kamakura shogunate, who had their base in Kamakura, the Ashikaga shogunate actually ruled directly from the capital city, Kyoto. In other words, the Ashikaga shogun lives in Kyoto. So the first, for the first time ever, we see a merge between aristocratic culture and warrior culture because the shogunate is centered in Kyoto. So while during the Kamakura period there was this little divide between the Kamakura shoguns and the Kyoto aristocrats, now the Ashikaga shoguns are living and ruling out of Kyoto. So there's a merge between aristocratic and warrior culture during the Muromachi period. And some scholars call this the Ashikaga period, but most of them call it the Muromachi period because the Ashikaga shoguns ruled out of a palace that was located inside the Muromachi district. There's a district in Kyoto known as the Muromachi district. So for that reason, we call it the Muromachi period. The Muromachi period is not peaceful, okay? And it was actually the most bloody period of Japanese history because Basically, from the get-go, there was some sort of turmoil in the country, okay? One, one form or another. Right after becoming shogun, Takauji is constantly having to deal with the southern court. Remember, the southern court are Emperor Godaigo's descendants, the son and children of Emperor Godaigo, who are trying to get rid of the Ashikaga shoguns and get revenge on Takauji for defeating Emperor Godaigo, okay? And... Uh, Takauji dies in 1358. He never really gets to enjoy his position of shogun, okay, um, because he's constantly dealing with the southern court. And even after Ashikaga Takauji dies, uh, the southern court wants to get control of Kyoto because they say, you know what, the former emperor Godaigo's descendants are, we want to put him back on the throne because we were the, we should have been, our line of the family should have become emperor. The problem is that the actual, the real emperor is still a member of Godaigo's family. It's not like, um, you know, it's not like it's a different dynasty. It's the same family, just it was a cousin becoming emperor instead of Godaigo's son. So it's the same bloodline, but Godaigo wa Godaigo's children wanted the title for themselves. So there's constant bickering between the Ashikaga and then these southern court pretenders, as they're called. Uh, so 10 years later, in 1368, Ashikaga Takauji's grandson, Yoshimitsu, becomes the Ashikaga shogun. And he was only 10 years old, but he was very, very smart from a young age, and he's considered to be the greatest Ashikaga shogun ever. And the reason he's considered to be the greatest is because he comes up with a brilliant system, or some might say brilliant, some might say it, it brought Japan down, but we'll see, you can judge for yourself. But in the 1370s and 1380s, he comes up with something called the daimyo system, and this better organizes and unifies the country. So what is the daimyo system? Well, under the Kamakura system, you might remember that the shogun and the Hojo regent, they would send a representative, a provincial governor, from Kamakura to rule over each province in Japan. And... Uh, under the daimyo system, daimyo means a warrior clan or a warrior family. Under this new daimyo system, the Ashikaga shogun would himself select a family, a specific warrior family, who was native to each province to be responsible for ruling over that province. Okay? So, for example, if we're talking about Satsuma province, which is in Kyushu, the Ashikaga shogun would select a powerful samurai family from that province, who was born and raised in that province, and he would say, from now on, you, in the case of Satsuma, they were the Shimazu family. He would say, okay, Shimazu family, from now on, you and your descendants will rule over this province. If I need anything in that province, you're going to be the person who will be responsible for dealing with that. And this daimyo system was hereditary. So it would go from father to son, father to son, and that family would be ruling over that province. And then if there was ever an issue, they would be directly reporting to the shogun in Kyoto. So this daimyo system has pros and cons, okay? Let's think about what some of those pros and cons were.
pros, there was so many provinces, it's very hard for one person to control them, right? But if you have a powerful warrior family, a daimyo family, looking after that their own province, it's much better organized, right? Quality of life improves in the provinces because the daimyo only have to worry about their own province. They don't have to worry about other provinces. They just have to worry about that one province. So <clears throat> they can focus on increasing and improving the quality of life in that specific province, right? So it's easier to control each province. Also, it was their own province. Remember, the daimyo families are selected based on whether or not they're native to that province. So because they're dealing with their own province, where they live, where their vassals live, where their families live, they really have more on the line than if it's some foreign governor being sent from Kyoto, who doesn't really care about the province. These daimyo families love their provinces, they love their people, they want to help their people. So they're really serious about in improving the quality of life. Unfortunately, while the daimyo system was very, very good for each province, it was a horrible system for the country as a whole. Government becomes basically decentralized, less centralized, because each daimyo was only concerned with their own province and their own province's issues, their own domain. They don't care about neighboring provinces or faraway provinces. They just care about their own province. So essentially, Japan breaks up into small individual provinces that are each ruled by their own families, and they're not really concerned about unifying the country as a whole. So power becomes very, very decentralized. <clears throat> and this creates a problem because sometimes individual provinces <clears throat> would go to war with each other. So there were little civil wars in Japan. For example, uh, two provinces who are neighbors want control of a certain piece of land. They're going to go to war with each other because they're only in it for their own province. So that's why this period, the Muromachi period, is sometimes called the era of warring states because you have a weak emperor at the top. You have a shogun at the top, the Ashikaga shogun, who's weak because they've given too much power to the individual provinces who are now warring against each other. And the problem is the Ashikaga shoguns one of their flaws is they did nothing to stop fighting between individual daimyo clans and provinces. So during the late 1300s, 1400s, and 1500s, there was continuous, constant warfare all across Japan between individual daimyo. They were fighting over provinces, there are sometimes family feuds, they are fighting to uphold each other's honor, and the emperor and the shogun do nothing to stop it. So the country basically disintegrates into small provinces that are semi-independent, warring against each other. But, you know, even <clears throat> because of this, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu is still considered the greatest Ashikaga Shogun. <clears throat> he did establish this daimyo system, good or bad. It did last until 1868. So it did last for quite a few centuries with all its flaws. And, you know, there were some changes later on that we'll see to the daimyo system, but it mostly did stay <clears throat> in place until 1868. So there were, you know, with some small modifications, it did stay um, around for a while. So um, another big achievement of Yoshimitsu is in 1392 he finally unifies the imperial court once again. So he tells Godaigo's descendants, the southern court, let it go, let's just, you know, it's, it's your family, it's your same family that's ruling, just cousins instead of you guys, just just let them, let them do it. It's basically the same lineage. So they are unified again, and Godaigo's descendants finally acknowledge the real emperors in Kyoto, and they realize, you know, they are a family. It's a cousin versus a son. Who cares? Same thing. So the imperial court is brought together thanks to Yoshimitsu's mediation. Um, also, what Yoshimitsu does is he finally opens up diplomatic relations with China once again. Godaigo had sent a trade mission to China in 1325, and the first Ashikaga shogun, Takauji, had sent another mission there in 1339. So G Yoshimitsu piggybacks on that, and he says, we're officially opening up diplomatic relations and starting up the missions to China again. Okay. And uh, he, now China was under the Ming Dynasty, so it was safe to travel there once again. The Ming Dynasty was one of the great Chinese dynasties. And so Yoshimitsu loves Chinese culture. 
Uh, he, he really wanted to start up the missions to China again. And it was rumored that he even liked to wear Chinese clothes. He was, uh, he was very interested in Chinese culture. So missions are now being sent again to China for the first time since 838. Okay, and this really benefits Zen Buddhism because there were a lot of new elements of Zen Buddhism from China that now came to Japan. So Zen really becomes very, very powerful during the Muromachi period. And uh, this also, the, the missions to China also benefit literature because aristocrats and warriors alike are now becoming interested in reading new literature from China in Chinese. Okay, And warriors especially love the Confucian texts because it goes right in hand in hand with their concepts of loyalty and morality to the state. So Yoshimitsu is really a patron of the arts, uh, and this is because he was born in Kyoto. So he was a warrior. He was a great warrior, but he was also able to accept and appreciate the aristocratic culture of Kyoto. But here's the big difference. The Ashikaga never discarded their warrior culture. Even though they were living in Kyoto, they never discarded their warrior culture like the Taira did. And this is really a key point, because the shogun was based, the shogun, the Ashikaga shogun that was based in Kyoto, so starting in the Muromachi period, for the first time, you have a mix between <clears throat> warrior culture and aristocratic culture. They are combined. <clears throat> but unlike the Taira, who forgot about their uh, warrior culture, and unlike the Kamakura shogunate, who forgot, completely forgot the aristocratic culture, the Muromachi period sees the Ashikaga shoguns and the samurai combining warrior culture, rustic warrior culture from the countryside, with aristocratic culture from the capital, from Kyoto. So it's not uncool anymore to be a warrior and to like aristocratic things. It's, it's combined now. So because Yoshimitsu was a patron of the arts, he built something called the Golden Pavilion in the northern part of Kyoto. And this Golden Pavilion was a vacation villa for Shogun Yoshimitsu. It's a beautiful, beautiful area. Now it's a park. Of course, you cannot go inside the Golden Pavilion. This is closed off to the public. But this was Yoshimitsu's special vacation villa. It's a beautiful place. I highly recommend it. And in addition to building the Golden Pavilion, Yoshimitsu also built a permanent palace residence for the Ashikaga shoguns inside Kyoto. It's called the Palace of Flowers. And one time Yoshimitsu had a banquet there for 20 days, constant partying for the emperor. Okay, so this Palace of Flowers is no longer standing in Kyoto, but the Golden Pavilion still is. So Yoshimitsu dies in 1408. He lived for a long time. And uh, unfortunately, after him, the Ashikaga Shogunate begins a century, over a century of decline. Um, from 1408 basically to 1573. 